Welcome to the Real Estate Mogul MD Podcast. Thanks for tuning in and taking control of your financial future. This is a show where we not only motivate and inspire, we give you actionable, real-world experience to help you live life by design. You'll hear journeys and stories from other physicians, investors, coaches, consultants, and entrepreneurs. And now, here's your host, Brett Riggins. All right, here we go. Another episode here on the Real Estate Mogul MD. And um, I was just telling uh, the guests here that... I- I didn't push record on this first time. So we get to practice this intro here again. Today, I'm speaking with practicing physician, a physician coach, physician mentor, podcast host, husband, and father with a passion to make physicians and other healthcare providers lives less stressful. Mr. Jude A.P. Air, MD, aka Coach J.P. MD. How are you doing today? I'm doing wonderful. Thanks for having me on your podcast. Yeah, awesome. And I just throwing that note out there. I, I didn't push the record button. So I got to practice that intro twice, man. Cool. Fun stuff. And I was also, we were talking about, um, we are both musicians because for the listeners can't see, there's a little keyboard there in the back and I've got a guitar hanging on here. And we joked about, you know, having a, a virtual jam session here, right? Love to. Awesome. So um, I always love jumping right into this and learning a little bit more about your journey. Like what what made you become a physician and then your journey summary of where you're at now? So uh, growing up, uh, my mom and, and parents always told me that I wanted to, I've always said I wanted to be a, be a physician. And so I just followed that passion. And uh, I was actually born in New York, raised in Haiti. And uh, my parents were Haitian. And uh, I had the, the wonderful opportunity of living in another country. Came back for college and medical school. Went to medical school. I went to Howard University in D.C., uh, medical school in New York, um, at Albert Einstein College of Medicine, and did my residency training at uh, Jackson Memorial Hospital in Miami. So it's been an up and uh, journey up and down the East Coast, and and I just had a, lo- a love for fixing things and a love for for helping people. Um, I loved projects. Uh, Radio Shack had little projects that we used to purchase and and put together, and I loved breaking things and fixing them. and And now I'm not breaking patients, but fixing patients or trying to fix patients. <laughs> so uh, I, I've been practicing uh, uh, roughly around 23, 25 years now. Graduated uh, residence, graduated medical school in 1997. I finished my residency in 2000. And uh, since then, I've been doing, did a couple of years of emergency room medicine. And now I'm practicing internal medicine in uh, the Tampa Bay market. And, um, you know, that's, that's the medical journey. And uh, it's been, it's been great. Very interesting. And born in New York and then raised in Haiti. When did when did you back to the States then from Haiti? Seventeen. I was seventeen. I I've not back. been I've not been to Haiti. All, and I'm um geographically challenged as well too. But I know that Haiti shares uh is an island that's shared with another country and there's there's two totally different extremes. Right. Yeah. It feels that's like Haiti. And that's the Dominican, right? As Dominican Republic. And uh, right. the island is Hispaniola. And, um, you know, if you read history, we know why it was separated, but the Spanish kind of occupied the eastern side and the Haiti uh, is occupied, or the Haitians occupy the western side. And so the languages are different. Uh, the culture is different. Uh, although there's a lot of similarities mm-hmm. for the most part, uh, we do, or we are two different people. And, uh, there's a lot of lot of history that yeah. is uh, explaining what's happening now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and then back here in medicine now, um, I know that you do you work a lot on the tech side too, and you have this interesting platform um, that shares your experience on the tech side, and I think it's related to to um, the Medicare uh, world, right? Yeah. So, excuse me. So a couple of years ago, I, I went through some, some some life events and I realized that some of my events were related to me not knowing the business of medicine, not understanding how to manage finances. And and I have been doing managed care, which is a, a, a niche in the Medicare Advantage world where we care for a panel of patients. And if we take care of them well, we prevent things and we keep them from going out, going to the hospitals. Uh, it can be a lucrative um, business proposition. So that's what I've been doing for the past 20 years. And I decided to start, set up a, a course, uh, learnaboutmedicareadvantage.com is where my course is. And 
and basically teaches physicians everything that that I've learned uh, in a course format. And uh, that's what I've been helping physicians with. And um, it's been it's been a wonderful journey because uh, I do like to teach. I love to teach and I love to also help physicians avoid the pitfalls of medicine. And the things that even today I have uh, residents and, and students telling me that they had no idea about managed care and about, uh, you know, how things work in the business. And I, I refer them to the course. That's awesome. Being able to share that. I think that's a free course too on your. Yeah. Yeah. There's a free thing. course and then there's a, the, the advanced course is, is paid and um, it, it's, it's something that I, I'd like to offer to everyone mm-hmm. uh, as I think it, it, if physicians understand the business of medicine well, and they take care of their practice finances as well as their personal finances, I think that's the only way that they can care for patients in a, in a powerful way. And then taking care of the business of medicine, and I hear this a lot, um, where it's not it's not a piece of the uh, career education, right, Jude? It's this hole that's out there. And actually, I had a very interesting conversation just recently um, with the CEO of uh, Society of Physician Entrepreneurs, and that they are working to kind of help fill this hole. But it's it's these opportunities where. Uh, physicians get to share their experiences to others, and I can hear it in my in my in my head already. Is like, I wish I had this when I was there, or I wish I had this when when I did that. You know, and I, I see that same thing across all platforms, not in just medicine, but uh, real estate, investing, in, in entrepreneurship, entrepre- being an entrepreneur in general. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and and what what happens though with physicians is, and I can say this because I've I've, I've gone through it. We go through medical school and residency to, and being told that we need to figure it out. Patient's sick, patient's in the emergency room, figure it out, take care of the patient. If you don't know, go research it. Mm-hmm. So we kind of have that notion of when we leave a residency training, we can figure it out. So we should be able to figure it out. We're smart guys. We're top of our class. We we score high on all kinds of tests. So we then leave medicine and say, Hey, we can figure out the practice of medicine on our own. Mm-hmm. We don't get mentors because we can figure it out. We'll do the research. Um, then you, you, you fall into some traps. And one of the biggest traps, I think, and I, I learned this from someone, I can't remember who taught me this or who said this, but he said, one of the biggest problems physicians have in medicine is success. Cause the minute you're successful, you're going to be bombarded by other people wanting to show you other things to invest in, other things to Mm. do, which distracts you from the focus that is actually bringing you the revenue. So you have to be very cautious what you get yourself into and build boundaries around those other investments and other things that you do that will take away from your core um, business, which is medicine. Now, once you understand that, then you know in business, you can't do business by yourself. You have to have partners, you have to have collaborators, you have to have people that you work with. But in medical school, we didn't have that. We were competitive. We want to be the best in our class. We want to, you know, uh, to do, you know, get the highest score in the test and you don't collaborate, you don't talk to the people. So, so we're trained, I believe, in the wrong way in the business of medicine, because business is about collaborating and about partnering with other people. Yeah, yeah. The the expanding association. So I I talk about this a lot, uh, where we, the benefits of expanding association, right, and and building these relationships to leverage relationships in order to um, expedite the journey or better the journey. But also limiting associations is a big piece too. And that 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 success um, is a trap kind of thing, the trap of success area where the, you still have to build these walls around what you're doing and not get involved in all of these other things, right? Yep. So expanding association and uh, limiting association, which is also a big piece. So um, a little bit right now, Jude, like where are you at? at are, are you a practice owner yourself right now? So I was a practice owner at one point. I then uh, merged back or joined my previous recruit uh, mm-hmm. uh, physician that recruited me to the area. So I'm an employed physician. Although the way we structured it, um, I kind of run my own profit center. Mm-hmm. So um, kind of hire and fire whoever I wish. Intra, intrapreneur. 
Entrepreneur, yes. Yes, entrepreneur. Very yeah. interesting. Which is, which is great when you understand the business uh, well, uh, because it gives you some leeway, but also it gives you the backing of a bigger organization that can help you in COVID times and things like that. Yeah. So um, it's a good a good partnership. And so that for the practice on the practice side, I do, uh, I am an employed physician, uh, but I also own my, my business. I own my real estate, uh, which is, you know, something that we'll probably talk about a little bit uh, as well. And that has given me the opportunity to um, grow a different revenue stream as well. Yeah. Perfect. Um, kind of jump into that too. So that now, so you ha- we're an entrepreneur and you, you're, employee, entrepreneur, employee, and there's some difference in the way that that money comes in, the way that we can offset um, that income as well, too. And then now you mentioned real estate. I would love to jump into that and say, okay, how does all of this affect um, getting getting into real estate? How has that been a challenge for you being a full-time physician? Yeah, I think I think the challenge was at the beginning um, when the market was hot in the, what was it? The late nineties, early 2000. Um, I actually bought my first condo in Miami. Huh. Uh, um, it was condo conversion and um, it was probably one of my better deals uh, where I purchased a condo at a very low, low price. I paid $85,000 for it. It ended up appreciating in two, three years to 130, 145. Oh. So I made a good profit there, but then I took that money and put it towards another property which we then flipped and and you know that's when i started my my real estate journey and i i i did i i think you talked about at the beginning uh when we were talking that you also flipped properties as well so i was one of those flippers and i thought i was going to make lots of money flipping houses and uh, then 2008 came and uh things came crashing down so so 2008 actually flipped you, it sounded like. Yeah, it sure did. Yeah. <laughs> it sure did. So, uh, so many people learned so many things uh, in that time period. You, you mentioned um, kind of conversion. What do you mean by that? So it was a um, condominium or an apartment complex mm. that the developers converted into condominiums. Okay. And so they they sold off each apartment as condominiums, yep. and it was right in the middle of uh, um, I don't know if it, you're I can't remember where you're from where you're based. I'm in Carolinas now. In the Carolinas, okay. Yep. So in Miami, there's a community near Coral Gables, uh, near University of Miami, actually. Hmm. Pinecrest is a really affluent com- community, and it was just on the outskirts of Pinecrest. So, so that's where I, I ended up purchasing uh, that condo, and it was right next to the uh, the Metro Rail. 10 minutes from downtown, 15 minutes from the hospital. So it was a great location. And that's kind of what I, when I realized how good, how important it was to, to buy real estate in good locations. Yeah. That, that that was the reason why it appreciated so much. Yep. So you were, it sounded like you're flipping before the 07, 08 thing yeah. happened. Mm-hmm. What, how did that affect you and your perspective moving forward from there? From 2008 forward? Yeah. Well, I mean, it changed my perspective completely um, uh, because during the time that we were doing those silly flips, I call them silly flips because we were doing it with no, with no money. Um, I had debt. I had medical debt. So I have $150,000, $160,000 in debt. And here I am flipping houses, which made absolutely no sense. And now it makes no sense to me. Um, and those that, of you that are listening, uh, you know, if you don't understand that, I, I had one, someone told me in the financial world that if you can get rid, if you can make, if you can invest in a an investment that will give you 8% guaranteed return every year, would you consider that a good investment? I said, yeah, 8% is a great investment. Get rid of your student debt as fast as you can. Because once you get rid of that debt, you've got 8% coming into your pocket every year that you wouldn't have had it because you have that debt. Mm -hmm. So most people say, well, we can make more money in the stock market. You can make 12%, 15% or doing other things, maybe even flipping houses. But I, I feel that if I had gotten rid of that debt, I wouldn't have been in the situation that, you know, 2008 came and, and crashed on us. So. Yeah. And very, very similar. Um, 
a guest that came on, we were talking about that same time period and their challenge was undercapitalization. And it sounds like that's exactly what you're talking about too, right, Jude? Yes, it is. So um, undercapitalization, then how were you acquiring these properties at the time? Was it all cash? Um, did you have a reserve for the repairs? Or tell me a little bit about the structure when you put those deals together. Well, there there was no... Um, so the, the original deal was... Um, was a pr- pretty good appreciation. So we use pretty much all of it to put towards the down payment on the next. So uh, we really didn't have the reserve. I didn't understand the concept of having reserves and even having money to, to cover, cover expenses or, or um, right. repairs. So, you know, we were very immature uh, yep. in, in our understanding. So uh, that I think is important. What you're what you're bring what you're making light of is that you can't go into these things thinking that everything's going to be rosy on the other side. Yeah, sunshines and rainbows. <laughs> yeah, you have to plan for those those rainy days. Yeah, and I t- I always tell everybody, dude, it's like for us um, acquisitions are one hundred percent mathematical. Uh, when it comes down to it, it's there's no emotion in them. And what I'm asking the question is, in my mind. I'm I'm reverse engineering these things. So, but again, you know, this is this is the world that I've lived in. This is exactly what I'm looking at when I see these things. I look, I see equations, right? And then from the outside looking in, it's almost okay. Okay, here's this house, and it could be worth this, but we're not taking into account all these other separate things um, that we know could go wrong. Let alone anything that we didn't even think could go wrong has the opportunity of going wrong. So. Um, with that, then that shift in perspective of um, capitalization and paying off uh, student debt, yep. where did that lead you back? When did you touch real estate again? It was probably 2014. Um, uh, if I can share a personal story, it's uh, after my wife said enough and uh-huh. uh, she filed for divorce. We we ended up uh, splitting in 2014. And there's other reasons and other issues going on as well. But um, I think that was um, the the culprit or the, mm-hmm. was the summary of, you know, just the bad decisions uh, of the past. And so at that point, I ended up getting a financial coach. I ended up uh, doing some research and getting a team together um, that could help me understand where I was going wrong. Um, sold off, got rid of everything and except kept my, my medical practice building. Uh, 2010, we actually did that deal. I bought that as a pre foreclosure or no, it was an estate sale, not an estate sale, but, um, uh, when someone passes away, oh my gosh, I can't think of the term. There's probate. Nah, right before probate. Um, I guess it might've been considered an estate sale. A person passed away um, and I purchased it from the estate. Yeah. uh, It was one of my best deals, uh, because then that redid the practice. Um, built it out to my specs and I've been in that practice or in that building since then. So uh, 2014, uh, moving forward, you know, I end up paying off my debt, um, except my house. Now we currently have a home that we uh, got remarried in 2021. Uh, so, uh, you know, everything got better <laughs> Yeah, to that uh, because of, of self-awareness. I think that's, that's the main thing. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, um, that's a whole nother world right there, the self-awareness piece yeah. and, and the journey. And I, the, the biggest um, advancements that I've made in my life, Jude, has been in times where the self-advancement and realization and, and these things about self-development have occurred, yeah. um, you know, has made me a better father, better husband, uh, better investor, hopefully a better leader, hopefully yeah. a better person in general. When you, that self-realization piece is is massive. Absolutely. Uh, thank you for sharing that that information too, because I'm sure a lot of the listeners have have similar challenges and and opportunities. Um, and you know, being able to hear that and the the fact that you've overcome them, and now the listeners can't see the smile on your face when you mentioned the 2021, um, and you know, kind of like hitting this this platform now of, oh, it feels good right? yeah. getting through these times and, and understanding where we're at. Do you think that um, kind of dive in back on a personal thing in, in 2014, when that uh, situation kind of like separated your life, 
Uh, do you think that had anything to do with the time spent in medical practice or living as a physician? Yeah, I think there's um, there's that stress component uh, for sure. Uh, because what happens is as you get busier and as you see your financial situation change, as children come about and you start to have more children and more expenses and more things, you tend to have to work harder. You have to work more. And I'm a soccer player. I played soccer and a little bit in college and mm -hmm. still play my kids play. And I stopped playing soccer. I stopped working out. Mm -hmm. So, you know, on the physical side, I wasn't as fit. Um, wasn't enjoying certain things as much as I should have been. So those things, um, the practice, this practice stress and not knowing how to deal with that definitely contributed. Yes. Wow. Wow. That's big. Um, and now here in 2023, <clears throat> you've got the, the medical practice building, excuse me. You have the medical practice building and, um, you've got your personal residence. Do you see yourself investing in real estate um, a, further in the future? Absolutely. Absolutely. What's your favorite part about real estate? I think the passive income. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's making uh, income without having to do as much work. Um, uh, we've looked at other businesses. We actually recently looked at a business where um, uh, more of a sports facility, where you have to, you know, you have to have people and you have to have uh, facilities and, mm -hmm. and uh, it just it seems like it was going to be a lot of work and we're still deciding on it. Not sure if we're going to pull that trigger yet, but when you look at, you know, the real estate portion, you're like, Oh, this is a little bit easier Yeah, uh, when, when you have income coming in steady stream and you've done it right, where you have equity in that, that real estate. So should you have a down market, you're not having to scratch your head where you're going to have the monies to, to, um, to pay the mortgage or, you know, the expenses. So the mortgages are lower when you have more equity in the properties, if you're, if you're doing it on the mortgage. And then the, the other thing I, I would probably steer away from buying, uh, or getting mortgages. I I'd want to do cash deals. Mm -hmm. I think that's where you really can do well, uh, when you're, when you're purchasing properties, even can flipping properties with cash deals. And when you say cash, is that, do you think that's because of the capitalization situation that, yeah, that you experienced? And, and, and I think, you know, I, I've, I really I went completely the opposite way in, in terms of debt and, and financing. And I really try to avoid, avoid debt as much mm -hmm. as I can. And maybe some of your listeners might not agree with me, but I yeah. think uh, those that I've seen that have been highly successful have very little debt, mm -hmm. which is, yeah, interesting. Yeah, and there's there's always two ends of the spectrum on this is is no debt and debt and on um, the types of debt, the way your perspective coming down to your risk tolerance. I mean, all of these things. So there's no one way, and that's what I love about investing. There's no one way. Yeah. Um, and when we look at investment scenarios in the single family path, is uh, understanding that it can be a I still worst case scenario. I want to make sure my cap rate my my straight cap rate is is um, something that's attainable mm -hmm. and um, it, it makes sense as the investment. And then when we look at leverage stuff, obviously we're looking at higher returns because we're reducing the capital that's in the deal. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then a bunch of different approaches too. If, if, if you're ca all cash in, you have a different capital requirement or a different package that you could go for. Um, where if you're leveraging debt, then you can have a more, uh, I say a higher valued property and you have more velocity in that regard. But, you know, I'm sure a lot of people have the same um, experience where it, once you get burned, it's tough. Like it's tough to, to go back and then put yourself at risk again by leveraging capital, you know? Yeah. Jude, have you read the book, um, Rich Dad, Poor Dad? I have. I have. I, Saki. Yeah, yeah, uh, Kiyosaki. And what are your takes on that book? Um, I think I've graduated from that book. Uh -huh. What do you where, mean by that? Uh, I, I think he he's a big proponent of no money down. Is that is that his big thing? Um, uh, really, that book for me is is the uh, just understanding the difference between asset and liability, and 
kind of like setting a path out there to, to stop trading time for money. That's my biggest takeaway of the book. Yeah. So, so I, I, I agree. I, I, I read his book. I mean, I read, mm-hmm. definitely love the book, but it's, it's been a while. Um, and I definitely believe we should buy, be buying assets yeah. um, and not liabilities. So anything that I feel um, is going to be depreciating, and, you know, you have to have a, a certain net worth to be able to buy depreciating assets. So I, I don't own a boat. I don't own, you know, things like expensive cars and things like that, because I just don't think that they're worth um, putting that much money into them unless you have a certain amount of income or a certain amount of assets. Um, I'm a big proponent of uh, Dave Ramsey. Um, so I, I've, I've learned a lot of things from him. Uh, I actually became a financial coach. Uh, at one point, uh, I went up to his uh, his organization and um, learned a lot of the the things that uh, help the consumers. Maybe not the high net worth individuals. Um, so, but real estate, I think, is is really the key. And after after a four hundred one k and and retirement investments, I think real estate should be something every physician should should look into. Yeah, yeah, and I hear that. I actually I hear that a lot too, Jude, on on the real estate piece because of the stability of it. Um, and just, you know, just encouraging everybody to, you know, do their research, whether they're, you know, cash or leverage, either one of the two, understanding the purpose of why you're acquiring it. Um, and if you focus only on appreciation, then you're going to create um, probably undercapitalization situations again. And, you know, there, what I love about um, real estate is stacked returns um, with cash flow, uh, if you are leveraging this principal pay down, there's depreciation. And when we do look at appreciation, it's completely separate of the acquisition. It is, it is a bonus to the return. And we can see appreciation, which is growth in the market value of the property, as well as growth in rents too. So there's just lots of ways when it's done right. It is very, very stable. And, um, given the markets too, it's markets can swing, but if you're picking the right markets, they don't swing as much. Agreed. Right. Even if, especially if you're not buying for appreciation, right. A lot of times we'll see um, appreciation happening in more volatile markets. So just as fast as it can go up, it can go down. And that sounds a lot like the wall street journey with, to me. Yeah. Um, you know, and that doesn't even say account uh, the, the interest rate. So when you are borrowing, you know, you know, my interest rate started off at, you know, 5%, 4% on the property. Now I couldn't refinance. I couldn't do anything with that property now at nine, 10, eight, nine percent interest rates. So mm-hmm. also a factor that, um, that has helped me. And, but now, I mean, I'm not looking into that as much because, um, again, trying to pay that down. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Another interesting thing that you have is the, um, the medical practice inside of a building that you own. Mm-hmm. So, um, can you share some of the advantages of that? Well, one of the biggest advantages is is in um, practice value. So one of the things that we look at when we're purchasing practices or partnering with other physicians is, hey, do you own your real estate? If you don't own your real estate, uh, when you go to sell that practice, it doesn't have as much value. And most physicians don't understand this concept. And that is when you are ready to retire and you're going to sell your practice, your practice is worth nothing really nothing without you. Because once you sell that practice, patients have the freedom to go wherever they want. And if you're part of a managed care organization and you sell the practice, the managed care organization actually owns those patients and that membership. So if they don't like what's happening, they can take and move that membership. So the person purchasing the practice doesn't have doesn't have anything. But if you own real estate, you can leverage that and say, hey, I have the practice and the location, my practice is worth a million bucks or you know, three quarters of a million dollars. So you you definitely I say if you if you have the opportunity, purchase it. That's one big advantage. And of course, the other advantage is expensing out exp- expensing out things. So uh, you're able to not have to um um things that ha- that you're improving in the building. If it's a, a you know uh, an upgrade, we we actually add rooms in our in our uh, facility recently added a phone room uh, did some painting uh, did some construction work and that then appreciates the property so you're expensing out and you're also helping improve it 
which is helpful in the appreciation of that property's asset. asset. Mm-hmm. And and you're paying yourself. Um, so uh, you're paying yourself rent and that becomes another income stream. Absolutely. And the interesting piece of that rent, Jude, is you have control of that rent, the amount of rent, um, but that rent actually drives the value of the building. So it's it's interesting. You are making that you have the ability to decide the value of that because in commercial real estate, it's based off of the net income, net operating income, right? It's how we value the building. So you have the ability to drive the value of that building. Yeah. Very interesting. I love it. I love it. And the way that um, there's some tax benefits, massive tax benefits in that um, uh, journey as well, too. Absolutely. So what would you, you have to have a, and you have to have a good accountant that can help you through this journey as well. And that's what I, I, I learned, um, you know, having good, good consultants and good accountants uh, that can help you yep. see the benefits and, and reap the benefits. Yep. And you said when you went out and you built that team to help kind of look at where you're at currently, decide where you want to be, and then implement these steps, what type of uh, structure did that team have? Like, who are your power members? of your team my accountant um my financial coach um and my attorney nice. so those three uh, has to be and and have a um a builder so my mm-hmm. builder also is a who built out the building is a it's a friend and and a patient so uh mm-hmm. he's able to help me make decisions on you know improvements here and don't do this don't do that um, here's a location, you know, things like that. I think it's important when you're getting into real estate to, to have someone that is in the market and knows the market. Yeah. Can help you make decisions on that property. Absolutely. What would you tell somebody who is interested in exactly what you say about owning the building that their practice is in? Like, what would be some advice that you would give them? Um, plan for growth. So, um, my partner and, and friend, Dr. Singh, told me when I purchased the building, it was 3,500 square feet. Um, he knew how aggressive I was and what I wanted to do. And I built it uh, from the gr- from scratch and I put seven exam rooms. And he said, that's too small. I'm like, huh? And in three years, when I hired another physician, a nurse practitioner, it was too small. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I would say just plan for growth. Even if you think you don't, don't need that extra two or three exam rooms, just plan for it. Uh, because it's hard to, once you've built out a good population of patients to then take everything and move to another location, because by that time, the real estate is probably going to be more expensive, mm-hmm. it'll be harder to move unless you plan on adding another office to your practice. And yeah. And you talked about, um, adding value to your practice in, in that real estate aspect, imagine the increase in value to say, Hey, this is the, this is the build, this is the practice, this is the building. And guess what? there's room for growth, yes. right? So the, the the value that we would bring for that too. So very cool. Um, that I think that's great advice. Is there somebody out there that you know that you think the listeners should know or listen to when it comes to either medicine or real estate or finance? Ooh, uh, that's, that's a great question. Um, I, I just listen to so many different people. Uh, like I mentioned, Dave Ramsey, uh, uh, some people might like him. I love him because of what he tells, the basic principles that he has um, uh, instilled in me. Um, Dr. Singh, my uh, my uh, mentor and partner, he's also, uh, he loves physicians. He loves to help physicians uh, grow. And we're, we're all pro, we're a very pro physician group. And um you know, I don't think he has a podcast, but he's open to, I'm sure, you know, listening to or getting emails from people so I can share his information and where you can find him as well. Um, but those are, those are the two main people. Yep. That's awesome. And of course, Coach JPMD himself, everybody can find you out there on coachjpmd.com. You have also a podcast where we talk about a lot of the stuff that we've talked about today, and that's practiceimpossible.com, right? That's where everybody can find you there. That's right. Um, to, uh, helping populations live long by increasing their awareness of spiritual, mental, and physical health globally. So we interview uh, thought leaders and experts in fields of uh, medicine and health and 
and uh, science and um, just help physicians understand what they need to do to, to, um, to grow personally and to, you know, improve themselves because if they improve themselves and they, that's the only way they can help improve their patients. Absolutely. That's that self-realization, that self-development piece. And I, in my mind, I'm always relating it to um, getting my head above the weeds. If I can't get my head above the weeds of life and all of the stuff that's going on inside of me, then I'm not able to help other people. I've got to be able to help myself first. That's right. In order to help other people. That's absolutely right. Well, Jude, ben, I appreciate your time today. It's been wonderful. I, I love the stories, the experience. Thank you so much for sharing that personal um, journey with us. And hopefully we're able to to help others out there listening to the journey, sharing your experiences, sharing your opinions too, which really matter. Uh, I love getting everybody's opinion here. So uh, Jude, thank you so much, sir. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. <laughs> Um, thank you to the listeners out there today. Uh, it's been another wonderful episode here on Real Estate Mogul MD. You can reach Coach JPMD at that on the, on the um, Instagram or the dot com, coachjpmd.com. And you can send us any questions you may have about the episodes, uh, connections with Jude, or any topics or things that you'd like to discuss on the podcast as well. You can reach us at info at physicianwealthsystems.com. And we just appreciate your time today and we look forward to catching you on the next episode. Have a great day.